So, Wendy, there's honestly so much to unpack when it comes to your career um, and it's hard to know where to start, but I've decided to start maybe unoriginally uh, at your childhood. You grew up in Orange in country New South Wales and in your acclaimed memoir, Don't Be Too Polite Girls, you speak candidly about your complex relationship with your father. What kind of lifelong resolve did your relationship with him give you? I think the capacity to separate his personal behaviour when he was really in the throes of alcoholism from him being an engaging and fun-loving dad when he he wasn't and to somewhere in that time and I do tell the story in the thing about the the boy saying to me anyway your father's a drunk and I said so I know and I I now look back and I think that was the moment when I decided I'd settle for the good times with him I'd be my mother's protector um, and there were two other kids and, you know, I was the eldest one and my mother was very young and and that I would not wear the shame that went with him being an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. And it, it was more or less instinctive because by that time I was born in Orange and had the first seven years of my life, but by this time we were in Forbes and to go into town was a big thing. So... My father went in usually once a week to get supplies and you had to shop in there and it was 20 miles away. Um, And sometimes we'd go with him. And when I was living in the hostel when that boy made that statement, I used and and my mother and I would, um, she would rarely come into town with him. Um, But somehow or other, there were two pressures on me. I had... Very quickly, a realisation my father did, was not paying the fees for me to board and I would have to leave. I can't tell you how much I wanted an education because I'd had, in, in some ways, an idyllic life in a one-teacher school. Always come first in my class because I was the only one. <laughs> and, and I think, and, and read all the time, played with the little kids, looked after them. And, and I was given a lot of responsibility apart from my numeracy. And I think that tension and being my mother's keeper in a way um, was something that went with me in my life. But she, my mother bravely went and applied for a scholarship for me to stay in that little hostel. And I got it, but it was dependent on me being a good girl mm-hmm. and passing each year because it stopped, and I knew that wasn't a threat. It was real. I'd seen it happen to other kids. They just went back to the farm at 12 and suddenly they were 14 and and nobody noticed they hadn't been in school for two years. So for me, that getting into, I mean, I'd never been in a class with people. You know, I was a solo operator. And strangely, I never thought about it, about myself, but being out on the road talking to literally thousands of people in the last year, which Mm -hmm. has been great fun, I do see myself differently and I do see that independence Mm. and I see the longing always, the curiosity and the longing for the adventure of pursuing the curiosity is a big part of my life and sometimes that means I went on boards where I had absolutely no qualifications that I could see but someone else saw something in me and what I say to young women Someone sees anyone ask you to do something and they think you can, you probably can. And I think after 81 years and looking back on the career you've had, I think it's fair to say that uh, the roles that you were pushed into were the right ones. Um, After leaving school, you earned a scholarship to study teaching and this is where you began your career. Was starting your career in education an important precursor to your next steps in political lobbying and advocacy? Absolutely. I mean, first of all, I didn't even know what an arts degree was, but I had two scholarships to to go there Um, and I took the teaching one. And I know when I walked into the classroom with these shiny little faces in front of me, I thought, I've come home, this is my place. And I've never really let go of that. I just think of myself as working in different classrooms. Um, (laughs) And I knew that that was a really happy place for me. And because educational provision, preparation for teaching was a 
two-tiered system then. I had the joy of doing an arts degree and even though I was, you know, bonded to teaching, there was no pressure on you. There was nothing to do with teaching in your first degree. So you had an opportunity to think broadly, learn to research and, you know, and, and I'm a joiner, I, you know, from being a single operator in a, in a primary school and then moving to, a, you know, one, then having to go to a bigger high school. I found that I joined things and so, you know, I was in review and I played hockey and and I just loved university life. And yeah. then suddenly I was on demos, um, you know, and it was mo- mostly they were, strangely, they were demos about women in science, you know, how the world moves. I spent Tuesday morning talking to astrophysicist women, female. Yeah, wow. And I think then I knew that I'd always be a teacher of some sort. Um, and, of course, I didn't realise then that the trap for young women like me was that we were so thrilled with our teachers' college scholarships that we had to pay a, um, we didn't have to pay a bond back if we got married. Now, think about the deal of that. Mm. Men didn't have the same. Men got married. Mm. They had to pay the bond back if they left teaching. And it was only about 10 or 15 years later that I realised actually they were giving women jobs and men careers. And that's why you saw no female principals for years and years and years, despite mm. enormously um, intellectual, well-educated women. They were all casual. Mm. So they weren't in the system. So we, even the first women graduates, we were never in the system. Mm. For years and years and years we didn't get there. And that changed the face of education. But at least we were so happy to be educated that... I don't think we thought about it until we suddenly got sidelined if we had a child. I remember thinking, you know, have a child? I could be really brutal about this and say, if we decided not to give our child to the system or not to have one, mate, you wouldn't have a job. (laughs) So that's how that pathway took place. But I want to ask you about the establishment of the New South Wales branch of the Women's Electoral Lobby, which uh, you started in 1972. It seems to be one of the bigger turning points in your career and your dedication to equality and progress. Was there a really specific moment in time where you remember uh, realising, oh, my life is going to be about making the world fairer and particularly making it fairer for women? There were probably three or four quick moments. The first moment when I was thinking about a world being fairer for women was about strangely getting husbands into the labour room, labour ward. Um, and it was a big fight. And what we, we basically we were taking on the gynaecological obstetric groups in hospital. There were some very supportive doctors, including my obstetrician, who suggested I join the Childbirth Education Association. And that took me into... Um, anyway, we won that battle and there's nothing better than winning a battle and enabling people to, partners to be present at the birth, if that's what the couple wants. And then because of that, I met a whole lot of people I'd never met before and they were all interested in fairness and many of them were teachers and because they were the best educated women at that time in New South Wales, Australia. And that led me into abortion law reform And that's when I understood the fundamentals of feminism because I'd been reading feminist literature. I lived in London and and Pittsburgh and worked there um, before I came back to Australia and after my marriage. And suddenly that clicked. Being in charge of having a baby, whether the time was right, and then that moment of thinking, why did I never say that I'd had a termination of pregnancy? Every doctor I went to in in family planning in the UK and so on, people would say, and the doctor who where I got the pill from when I was getting married, they um, they all they all assumed um, no previous sexual experience or Mm. or lots. But when they asked the question, um, you know, any previous pregnancies, I just looked them straight down and say no. But I had had a termination, and. The Women's Liberation Movement, which was such an important movement at that time and talked really about inverting the, the, you know, the world on its head for female opportunity, that was the starting point. That was the literature I was reading. But I was always a person who wanted to 
flick the system. So women's electoral lobby, I couldn't wait for the revolution. I wanted reform right now. And that's still me. And some people think that's wussy and sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't.